Hello, and welcome to the Gallimore Free, a hodgepodge to delve through the annals of history. My name is Will, and I am joined here today in the lovely basement with uh, my good friend Nick. Thank you. It's great to be here, although it is a little soggier than it was last time. It is soggy. The, uh, the, the basement has um, suffered a slight flood over the last few days. Slight flood. Slight flood. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is, is that why we're still sort of wading in water? Uh, it, it's a little bit. But, you know, uh, when we were last here, we were in the middle of that heat wave and it was about 40 degrees. So nice cooling flood water. No, it's still hot and sticky. It's it's not cooling. But, I mean, your feet aren't hot, though, are they? <laughs> we have a very interesting episode afoot. That was quite good. <laughs> that was quite clever. Um, so we're, uh, we're going to be discussing... <laughs> A, uh, a certain British politician and uh, his dilemma whether to toe the line or sock it to them or sock it to them yeah oh it's a strong open isn't it it's terrible yes we're actually going to be <laughs> we're actually going to be talking about one of the most controversial politicians yeah. in, in British history someone who was known for his corpulent form Boisterous laugh and many, 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 many health problems. And and that person was uh, Prime Minister Frederick North. Frederick North. Now, Frederick North is probably a name that not many people are familiar with. His time in office and, and some of the decisions he made and the crisis he had to deal with are very well known. Yes. In fact, he, even if you don't know the name, he was actually the first minister or prime minister during the War of American Independence, you know, when they finally threw off the yoke of British oppression, as they, they're so fond of saying, or as I view it, you know, they sort of left the best club in the world. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's a topic that I, I think uh, is perhaps slightly glorified in America. Of course, it is, you know, the beginning of their country, so it's a very important moment, but maybe it's something that is glossed over slightly in Britain when we learn about the history of our country? No, definitely. I mean, in America, I I bet most Americans will go, oh, yes, it was the vile British led by King George III. And that's all they'd know. They wouldn't know anything about the actual political establishment who was behind the running of the war and in in charge of the effort of actually trying to win it. And really, George III's input was, um, I would probably summarise it as quite a lot of meddling. Yes, he, he liked to meddle. Yes. He was very much concerned about maintaining the royal authority of the crown. Yeah. But also he, he was a passionate believer in the, uh, the unwritten British constitution in the sense of, you know, the power of parliament over his subjects. Mm. And that was a huge issue during the war. But funny enough, we're, this is a podcast about Lord North and we're, we're already talking about other people, which goes to show you why he's probably not a figure known to people. Yeah, but... Um... Moving back to Lord North, though, has long been considered a, a bit of a, a weak prime minister. And this is mostly due, as we said, to his failure to put down the American Revolution. We'll go into his career, not his career from birth. <laughs> we'll, go in, we'll go from his birth to his career and, and to his downfall. But just to put into perspective Lord North, he was prime minister from 1770 to 1782, effectively. He was prime minister for 12 years. You don't get to be prime minister for 12 years without doing something right. I mean, look mm. at Thatcher. She was... God, we couldn't get rid of her fast enough. No. And then Tony Blair had a fair old lick, didn't he? He did. About 10 years, I think. But anyway, so you don't get to do this without having, you know, some form of capability. Mm. And there was an argument that there weren't really many credible alternatives, but, you know, you had William Pitt, um, and you had Grenville and Grafton, all of these massive political figures at the time. And he, he you know, he was in power for 12 years because him and the king had a really good relationship he was a very capable minister. He was very capable of handling finances. In fact, he was prime minister and chancellor of the exchequer at the same time. Yeah, and not to mention he had his constituency in, in Banbury to look after as well. Yes, all like eight of them. All eight of them, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, he, you know, he was commended at the time for his wit and his good speaking ability, which back then, as it was today, seems to be very strong criteria for somebody who wants to be Prime Minister. Uh, what I'm saying is, is Lord North probably would have been on Have I Got News For You. I, you know what? I don't think he would. Because one of the criticisms of Lord North as a character was that he was very much a sit-on-the-fence kind of guy. He didn't mm. like confrontation whatsoever. Mm. Like he, he 
really went out of his way to avoid it and he didn't like having arguments which is a bit strange for someone who sits in parliament <laughs> week after week having visceral hurled at you it is a strange career choice and it's also unfortunate that uh, he was leader during a time of uh, quite a major confrontation not just one major confrontation there are quite a few <laughs> confrontations which we'll, we'll get to but at the same time it's important to set the background of of lord north and society he went into so during the 18th century 18th century life was very much a, for his stratum of society, which was the aristocratic part of society, was all about impeccable manners and patronage. So everyone was sickeningly nice to each other because they wanted jobs. Back then, as an MP, you didn't actually get paid. Oh, OK. You only got paid if you were a minister in post in government. And every time you became a minister, you had to get then re-elected. So it's a bit like <laughs> being a, a, an intern with your eye on a minister role. A lot of our aristocratic people already came from wealthy backgrounds or wealthy enough that they could survive on a bit of debt for a while. Mm. And so the idea was you get into parliament, you then get a post in government, and then from that you get a nice cushy uh, pension or job thereafter that you can sort of, or a baron or a title which basically pays you a salary and you don't have to worry about money after that. Uh -huh. But the whole point of getting into the parliament was the idea that their job, their duty, was to uphold Britain and the, and the government and, and to make you know, make the country great. So Lord North had a title. His father had a title. But he was considered kind of a half and half, half elite, half commoner. So mm -hmm. he had the uh, common touch. I guess, I guess uh, si sharing similarities to our friend Bojo, who could sort of come off as quite ordinary, but is in fact quite an incredibly aristocratic fellow. Mm -hmm. Alexander de Piffle, Boris Johnson, I think is his name. It's, it? it's, I just remember the... the Piffle bit. Yeah, it's... Um... You don't meet many de Piffles. <laughs> yes, back, back to Vegador. So, uh, Parliament was a kind of diverse place in a way, but diverse in the sense of not really. It was still a bunch of old, rich white men, and they were mostly lawyers, generational aristocrats, doctors, and country gentlemen. Now, I, I find this really, this really strange. A whole section of Parliament, around 100 to 150 MPs, were just country gentlemen who sort of had their own little faction in Parliament. So back then you had the Whigs and the Tories, mm. but Parliament itself was a, a kind of a melting pot. No one really stuck to their political parties. They sort of blended into different administrations. You know, you had Whig prime ministers with Tory ministers, or you had Tory prime minister with Whig ministers. Lord North himself mm. ran on a Whig platform. He ran for the Whigs, but he was very much a Tory. Yeah, you don't tend to get that so much anymore. The idea of, you know, say... The example Hughes Boris Johnson coming in as Prime Minister for the Tories, but actually having Labour, you know, sentiments, it he wouldn't have lasted very long. Yeah, because it was more about personalities than it was parties. It was more about the individual and the capability of the individual, rather than oh, you know, your political allegiance. Uh, and yeah. in fact, that played really well for North because he never really joined a faction. His fence sitting meant that he wasn't seen as a Whig. He wasn't seen as a Tory. Mm. And the country gentlemen really liked this. So they would become a key power base for him because they were very much against the idea of factionalism, so, as was the king, who hated Whigs in general. Ah. Yeah. He had a full head of hair then, did he? <laughs> he did, yes. So um, when, we, when we talk about country gentlemen, yeah, are the, these are rural landowners, are they? They are. They are rural landowners. Yes. Okay. So people who are just there to protect their rights and make sure that no major waves are made and that they can go on living happily ever after with all their money and land. Sounds like a nice deal. Yeah, it's, it's funny how times don't change. Um. Uh, so um, shall we go into a little bit about the background of uh, Frederick North, where he came from? Ah, so Frederick North was born in April 1732. He was the only son by the first marriage of the future, then first Earl of Guildford. He was born to uh, Francis North, mm -hmm. who was also MP for Banbury. So Frederick North had become MP for Banbury, as we've mentioned. But it was a hereditary seat in many ways, and this was quite common back then. Like you know, your father would. I mean, you still have to get elected, mm. but because you knew the area, the locals knew you, they were like, oh, your dad did a good job. You'll do a good job. Ah. Uh. Yeah. And Francis North, we won't talk about him too much, but he was a very interesting figure and he was a very domineering figure. In fact, most of what we know about his son, Frederick, mm. comes from Frederick's letters to his dad. Unfortunately, his dad's letters to him haven't survived, but mm. Frederick's letters have. He asks him for advice all the time. He's very, he's very devoted to him. Mm. 
I mean, this was also part of the time where, you know, as we've said, it was very polite and everyone was very polite to each other. Yeah. But he seemed to he seemed to live in the shadow of his father in many ways. And I think that's some have suggested this is why, despite his desire not to be in conflict with anything and have actually just a quiet life, he got into politics to impress his dad. I see. Yeah. Though, I mean, despite this, it does seem like they were genuinely quite close for the most part. They were, um, but funny enough, one of the things North faced throughout the entirety of his life was, and this is quite hilarious considering he was Chancellor of the Exchequer for 12 <laughs> years and served on the Treasury Board for about five, six years before that, he was terrible with managing his own money. He right. was constantly in debt. He constantly overspent. And he didn't even have a lavish lifestyle. He didn't go out partying. He didn't engage in adultery and whoring and, and all that. And his dad didn't have that much money, but he didn't really ever seem to give him any money or help. Uh, maybe he went out for too much, you know, avocado toast and um, exactly, flat lights. Yeah. yeah. But it's okay because the government kept giving him houses. But I mean, just on the side, uh, we, we've talked about his father. On his uh, mother's side, his mother was Lady Lucy Montague, who was descendant of Henry Montague, who was um, uh, very close with Henry VIII. And he was actually the executor of Henry VIII's will. Uh, and she was also related to Samuel Pepys. Oh, cheese man. Cheese man. Uh, famous for burying his cheese during the Great Fire of London. I wonder how, that cheese must have tasted extra smoked uh, that, after you've dug it up. That is one way to make a fondue, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> uh, Frederick was descended from some pretty um, important nobility, though. Uh, if you believe the rumours at the time, uh, he may have been even nobler than that, uh, as North bore a strong resemblance to George the Third. Uh, which made some believe that he might have been the illegitimate son of his father. No. You mean George II? George II. <laughs> yeah. He comes before George III, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Yes. They're, they're very complicated. That's how numbers work. They're very usually, complicated, yeah. these, these king names. Yeah. Uh, yes, so uh, George II. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Back with a vengeance. <laughs> the the rumour was that he was the Ill- illegitimate son of George II and half-brother to George III, who he would later become very close to. They do have a striker. No one can verify this. Like No one ever suggests that Lady Montague had... There was any sort of no. improperness between her and the, and the royal family, but they do look so like... They, they even have the same sort of corpulent face. It's like it's crazy. crazy. There's also records of people at times saying that North had a slightly dull appearance, but I'm assuming they didn't say that with an earshot of the king. The king and him were actually not just physically alike. They were alike in character and ideals in so many ways, which is why he lasted for 12 years. It's, it's funny, though, because he, he took all the comments about his appearance in, in Great Stride because he was, he was quite, as we've mentioned, he's quite, he started off young and slim, like mm. we all do, and then became quite fat quite fast and had a lot of health issues as he progressed in life. But he was very like gracious about it and humorous about it to himself. Like, there was a, apparently a moment where one of the former... First Minister's George Grenville described uh, his appearance as blubbery. Blubbery. <laughs> Which is n- never a nice thing to describe no. something as unless you're talking about a nice big, I don't know, whale. And Grenville made a re- regard about him being, you know, quite ugly as well. Mm. To which uh, Lord North was said to retort um, that he, his wife and their daughter were the three ugliest people in London. Right, he was self-deprecating. Yeah, he was self-deprecating. And oh, that okay. he, he, another commentator at the time mentioned that he seemed to absorb insults like a cannibal hitting a woolen sack. Oh. Uh, again, a backhanded compliment, I suppose, in many ways. I guess so. It's probably um, a good attribute to have if you're getting into politics. It is, and it paid off very well because it meant that a lot of people actually liked him because yeah. he was quite witty and he could speak well and you know he didn't, didn't look that much, but he sounded great. He'd be, he'd be a face for radio. He'd be a great radio presenter in today's society. Uh, I know someone like that. Steve Wright? <laughs> Are you talking about me? No. <laughs> All right. No, I'm talking about your wife and daughter. Uh, they are not lookers because um, they don't exist. Uh, so he was actually the first of his family to be educated at Eton. Ah, that's um, it's a good start for a prime minister. It's, it's uh, uh, you'd, you'd think so, yeah. And yeah. then went on to Oxford. <laughs> yeah, he's um, definitely... Playing it by the book, isn't he, there? There's a few conflicting reports. Some say he was really capable and he was really diligent. Others say he was like 
a bit away with the clouds. So he would forget things quite easily or just be a bit distant. And uh, But everyone generally really liked him. Mm. The problem The problem with Lord North was that you didn't really hate him. You either really liked him or you just got exasperated with him. And so after he, he went to Oxford, he did well there. He went on the thing that every young man in Europe, the aristocrat does mm. in their young life, in the 18th century, something called the Grand Tour. Yes, I've, that's on Amazon Prime, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And sadly, he didn't go, you know, traveling around well, in his Ferrari <laughs> punching catering stuff. No, no. Remember, this was the age of politeness. Oh. So no one would be punched. It would no. be a, it would be a it would be a viciously satirical letter written. You there. You yeah. have an ugly mother. Yes. Well, no, it wouldn't even be that. It would be something more witty and urbane like, I must say, the, the, the uh, obstensive features of your mother are quite recklessly offensive to most passers-by or something like that. So pretty much what well, everyone fancied themselves as Oscar Wilde at the time. Yeah, right? yeah. It'd be a withering put-down oh. in, in a satirical form. Oh, how droll. Yes. yes. But the Grand Tour, it's sort your, of... Your physiognomy is most abrasive. Well, I, I mean, I don't understand those words, so I feel very <laughs> threatened right now. Uh, but yes, the, the Grand Tour is kind of the predecessor of, of the Gap Year, I guess, but uh, exclusively for the upper classes. Uh, and it was considered, uh, and men, of course, women didn't go on Gap Years. Oh, no. <laughs> women didn't go on Grand Tours. A woman being educated? Exactly. Outrageous. Yes. It was for uh, young rich men uh, after they'd left university and it was a sort of rite of passage back then and they would travel across uh, usually Europe and they would uh, be exposed to things history and culture they would also meet and spend time with the aristocracy of Europe and and form connections a bit of networking you know and a lot of shagging quite a bit of shagging quite a bit of drinking um, just not on you know Thai beach resorts or Israeli kibbutzes, but rather, <laughs> you know, Vienna. Although uh, North himself was, as we've said, a dull character, so he didn't actually uh, reportedly engage in much sowing of oats, which was the term used to shagging around by then. No, so he um, went. He he travelled with his friend Lord Dartmouth, who probably found him to be a bit of a downer. But he was a bit dour himself. Oh, yeah. Uh, but during their tour, uh, North and Dartmouth. Um, spent nine months in Leipzig at one point where they studied under the constitutional scholar Johann Jakob Maskov. Do you mean Leipzig? Leipzig? Is it Leipzig? Yeah. I thought it was called it Leipzig. <laughs> well, you showed me. I mean, I'm not German. Is this a put-down? I'm not German, <laughs> but having watched the football, they always call it the other one, not, not Leipzig. Oh, well. They go Leipzig, well it, RB Leipzig. Okay. Well, if the football says that, then it's probably yeah, right. They'd probably know, right, wouldn't they? Yeah. So during the t- actually that that bit isn't very interesting anyway, so I don't think I'll bother including that because <laughs> I was gonna. Uh, what I should have done is said why Johann Jakob Maskov was notable, and all I could find was a German Wikipedia page, and it just said that he was pretty smart. Are you telling me you you do your research on Wikipedia for this? Uh, no, I don't. But when you Google <laughs> it, <laughs> if only people could see the look on your face. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what Wikipedia is. I'm sure That's I don't the know. Right you answer. you blubbery imbecile. That's the right answer. We do not take Wikipedia as a source. We simply take the sources that are on Wikipedia and read them in proper. I don't know like every about. history student. I got that out of um, a book that I got from. There you go. The, That's the British Library. I, I do find that so strange that like you cannot use Wikipedia as a source. Mm. But all my history professors when I was there was like, yeah, but use the sources as source. This is the old thing of like, well. Uh, did you see this film? Well, I actually, it was a book first and I have read the book and the book is, is much better. It goes into much more intricate details. Um, coming back to North, he uh, he was very much a fan of classical language. Like he would write his own Latin odes in Latin. I mean, how exciting he must have been. He sounds like a right laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so after he goes on this tour, he comes back to England and he immediately marries someone called Anne Speak at the tender age of 16. In fact, I don't think she was actually even 16. But she was the heiress of a very small estate. So he didn't marry into particular large amounts of wealth. Um, but he was very happy with her and he loved her and he may marry to her for the rest of his life, unlike his dad who just kept marrying people. However, uh, he was actually due to inherit from a rich relative of hers mm. who was a, a, a sort of West Country cider baron. But then, <laughs> characteristically of North, he, he's, he made a colossal mistake because he kept sticking to his principles. Um <laughs> which I'm, 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 I'm mocking, but I actually quite admire that. But he um, he supported a side attack in 1763, and so his uh, his relative disowned him, burned him in effigy, and didn't give him any money. Right. Yeah, he wasn't really playing the game there. No, no, he wasn't. 
Um, but he was he had a very happy life with his wife. They ended up having a lot of children. Some of them obviously passed, but uh, I think six children in the end survived. But yes, he didn't actually get into Parliament until 1754, at the tender age of 22. So he joined the family business. He did, and he would hold this seat for 40 years. Mm. We use the term elected quite loosely, because actually when we say elected, the number of people that were eligible to vote in Banbury was 18. Small town? It, well, no, they were just the ones who <laughs> had the vote. Back then, you had to have a certain amount of wealth and land to vote. Right. And often those people would end up being the BMPs. <laughs> Ooh, wonder how that worked. Um, but he didn't actually technically get voted in because his seat was uncontested, so he just automatically won. Like, a bit like Theresa May when she became Tory leader. Oh, right, she was just sort of waved in. Yeah, it was like, oh, go through. Well, we've got nobody else, so you might as well do it. Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's lucky for um, him, isn't it? It's, I wish I could get waved into a um, prestigious job. Well, you'd have to sleep with someone powerful or be related to them. Can you Can you do that? It just sounds like a lot of effort to me. I, I think you're a good-looking man, but I'm not sure you're that good-looking. No, no, I'm not, I'm not sure I could be bothered. <laughs> uh, yeah, procrastination and lack of beauty is, is probably your two main hurdles in life. Mm, is that... Yeah. Is that another witty 18th century style <laughs> put down? Um, and as we mentioned, he didn't really have a faction, but he stood with the Whigs. Mm. So at this point, he, he entered Parliament and his experience was Eton and Ke- Oxford. And then he went on holiday for a few years. It was straight into Parliament for him. Yeah, um, which didn't pay, as we mentioned. So yeah. he was... He was desperately always trying to seek a position in government, as every other MP was. Mm. And at the time, the Parliament had a, a, a number of 558 MPs. Oh, right. So, you know. well, maybe, maybe they shouldn't have so many constituencies with only 18 voters. And funny enough, the electorate could vary greatly. As we've said, 18 people voted for Banbury. Mm. Uh, in Yorkshire, there was 20,000 voters. And in fact, Parliament um, wasn't even a full-time year job. as It still isn't today. They get a summer break. It usually sat back then from November to May, so it was even, you know... Shorter. Yeah. Financial crisis, you say? No, I'm on holiday. Yeah, cost of living? No, it's I'll, fine. I'll get round to that in September. But So yeah, he floated around Parliament for a few years and then he got his uh, his big break mm. with William Pitt. Pitt, that's a famous name. I know it from Blackadder. That's why it's a it's, famous it's name. Pitt the Elder. He actually offered him a role in abroad, mm. which is basically a way of getting rid of people. Right. <laughs> so... Um, he really didn't want to turn it down because it came with a nice salary, but he he really wanted to get ahead in Parliament. So he actually basically said to Pitt, thank you, in the typical way of declining something, saying, this is a most wondrous opportunity. It's brilliant. It's it's changing my life. And then at the end saying, but I'm not taking it. This is normally my response when I'm asked to do the dishes. <laughs> what an honour it is for me to clean the dishes. But sadly, I cannot because... I cannot be asked. More or less, word for word, what he yeah. wrote uh, to, to Mr. Pitt. So did that have a, a detrimental effect on his career at all? Or? No. And eventually he got offered a, a, to be something really prestigious and some place where he could really shine. Mm. And that was a junior Lord of the Treasury. Right. Um, after, after, funny enough, a recommendation from the Duke of Newcastle, who happened to be his relative. <laughs> ah, right. I see how that um, one worked. Yes. Yes. Uh, It meant a lot of responsibility for him because it meant uh, he would have to stand in the Commons and defend policy. It meant he would have to help formulate policy and lots of committee meetings. It also meant, finally, a wage. Like, he was desperate for money. Oh, wow. Yeah. Pay off those student loans. He was continually out of money. Hmm. But he didn't live the life. It's it's just really weird how he was always out of money. It's It's just like he went into shops and must have been dropping, like, tips everywhere. But despite his own personal misgivings, mm. that's how we say, uh, four successive chancellors would come to trust him and h- keep him on board mm. during successive administration changes. Now, during this time, changing administration was a bit like changing your underwear. Right. It happened quite often. Um, and there were loads of former prime ministers knocking around in the House of Commons they... when he was prime minister, just sitting in the back benches going, you're rubbish, but in a polite way going, the eff- efficacy of your service is most under par. Oh, right. So they stuck around. They yeah, moved they to the back benches, yeah, did yeah, they? Yeah. He would have this role until around 1766 when he was finally offered the role of something better, mm. the role of Paymaster General of the Armed Forces. That does sound, that sounds like a pretty good role. And then he was also admitted to the Privy Council by Pitt himself, who was just, who liked him. Yeah. Like he, he was one of those people that you could argue with, but you'd still like him at the end of the day, which mm. is quite rare. Just going back 
just before he was offered the the paymaster role mm. under Pitt's government. So before Pitt came back into power, um, there was another government led by someone called George Grenville. It would be the last time he ever held the prime minister leadership because the king just really didn't like him. Mm. And funny enough, that administration fell apart <laughs> in July of 1765 after there was a perceived insult against the king's mother. So it shows you how sensitive a lot of these people were to. It was. I can. I can see why they were. They were quite like, what's the word? Loquacious, about how they, you know, criticised each Very other. Very good use of the word loquacious. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> well done. Thank you. It's sort of the theme of this episode, isn't it? Is unne- teaching you words <laughs> unnecessarily long words. In 1764, under Grenfell's government, this was the 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 beginning of the American troubles. Hmm if you will, because he he instituted something called the stamp duty tax. Hmm. It basically instituted duties on legal documents. And the problem with this was that the people that used legal documents and would have to pay this stamp duty were all the people you didn't really want to piss off. You know, your lawyers, your politicians, your merchants, hmm. your people who have education and money and power. <laughs> yeah. It caused so much trouble that For the first time, Parliament had to actually rethink its authority. Mm. So by the time uh, all the news of the disquiet had come back to the UK and they had to rethink about it, it, Grenville had actually gone. Mm. So the Duke of Cumberland (laughs) and his pals were in charge of the office and they had to think about what to do. Uh, It wasn't just him, it was another called Lord Rockingham who was also in the cabinet as well. And they had to think about how to stop trouble without losing face. So they did the very cunning thing of repealing the Stamp Act Mm. and then introducing another bill which said that Parliament could make any law it wanted that affect the colonies. Well, that that will cheer them up, won't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the Stamp Act itself, uh, as you said, went down very poorly among um, uh, the colonists in North America uh, who actually considered it to be a violation of their rights as uh, Englishmen, which they believed themselves to be at the time. Um, to be taxed without consent. And this gave rise to a saying which uh, has become very famous uh, associated with the revolution, which is no taxation without representation. Um, you see it written on banners and stuff when, when in protests a lot. So they, they, introduced, they obviously got this passed in 1766, and that was really the only major thing they did during their administration because Rockingham didn't last long once the Cumberland Duke had passed on, hmm. um, where, where you suddenly get Pitt entering the fray in Grafton, and then we get North back on the scene hmm. after he'd left the previous government. I mean, he'd supported a lot of the policies that had passed, including the stamp tax. He believed the stamp tax was inherently right because hmm. of its Parliament's will to govern the king's subjects. So then in 1767, having forgotten uh, the indignation caused by the Stamp Act, Parliament decided to pass... Uh, the first of what would become known as the Townsend Acts, uh, which were a series of new taxes uh, relating to glass, lead, paints, paper and tea. Uh, these are all things which had to be imported from Britain. Um, just, just a bit of interesting fact about that. Hmm. At this time, you could not trade with other foreign nations if you were a colony. You could only trade with Britain. Right. Yeah. Ah. So all... they, they, there was a lot of smuggling that went on. Yes. You find that with the Americas, it it wasn't so much. You sort of focus on the taxation issue, but there's actually lots of little things, and they all just sort of built up over time. Yeah, um, but North defended this actually. Funny enough, he, well, he defended the idea of the Americans being overly taxed anyway. He didn't seem to. None of the British elite seemed to see this idea of representation as an issue because they thought, well, you're all subjects of the king, and we're Parliament. We enact the king's will what are you moaning about but yeah the townsend acts so the the opposition to these acts was pretty fierce it led to violence in some instances uh, such as the boston massacre of 1770 uh, when british soldiers actually opened fire on a crowd of people uh, killing three of them they uh, the soldiers were brought to trial but only six of them were convicted and only of manslaughter and they were given reduced sentences and the whole thing did absolutely nothing to improve the mood but uh, Townsend didn't particularly last long mm. after this advice because Pitt, finally awakened from his illness, decided to get rid of him, um, especially after he voiced dissent over the the East India Company. So there was a lot of... We'll get to these in a couple of, in a second, but basically it was on its knees, basically, and it governed quite a lot of the empire and it had to be dealt with as an issue. It's something that North himself would actually come to deal with and contend with and and 
uh, and kind of make a sort of sticking plaster uh, policy to sort of tide it over for a while. But anyway, he was Pitt's choice to replace Townsend as Chancellor. Mm. Um, he offered him the job, or rather the Duke of Grafton wrote to him offering the job, uh, which he initially refused because he was actually with his dad, who was quite ill at the time, mm. and he didn't know if he was going to make it. But he was fine in the end. In fact, he, he would die shortly after his father later in life. Mm-hmm. It's like his d- father lived a feral lick. And in many ways, it's kind of a bit po- poetic that he died so shortly after his father died because maybe he was just living for his father. As we've said, he was a bit of a daddy's boy. Yeah. Um, anyway, he rejected it, but then he sent a, a second letter hastily saying, actually, <laughs> dad's getting all right. He's getting better. Can I have the job? <laughs> You'd have to hope that letter arrived before the first one. Um, so, but he got new digs out of it. So he oh, moved right. from Horse Guards Parade mm-hmm. to, can you guess where? Downing Street. Yes. Do you know which number? Four. Number 10. Number 10. Oh, that's, so, that is quite the promotion so there. Funny, well, funny enough, number 10 was not the official residence of the Prime Minister at the time. It didn't really become the official residence until a bit later. Ah. It was actually the residence of of the First Lord of the Treasury, which, funny enough, the First Lord of the Treasury today mm. is now the Prime Minister, which doesn't make any bloody sense, but... It's all historic layovers. Hmm. Yeah. So the the key ministers, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the, the First Minister, they were all lords of the treasury, basically. And oh. the first lord of the treasury is a, is, was a different role back then. It's, it's all confusing and complicated. So where did the Prime Minister live at this time then? Sometimes in their mansions in London, sometimes in the other, other houses on Downing Street. But yeah. number 10 was actually, uh, it was gifted from George II hmm. to Robert Walpole, who basically said he would like an official residence for the First Lord of the Treasury, which wasn't always the First Minister, and he made that number 10. Uh, so Walpole, he is sort of notable, isn't he, in that while he, he didn't have the title of Prime Minister, he was effectively the first Prime Minister. Yes, this is the thing. Like, the title didn't exist. So even when North was the First Minister, the title didn't really... It was actually... If someone called you the prime minister, it's kind of a bit of an insult, because it was it was more of a collaborative feeling. Like the cabinet had a lot more power than just the one individual. Yeah. So it wasn't really a term that was used. The first minister was just the minister that had the closest relation with the king. They yeah. were the one, which is why we still have it, and why the prime minister still goes to meet the queen and the king to say, "Can I form a government?" They yeah. can't say no anymore. But back then, the king could go, "No, I don't like you. Piss off. Go, go, go. Get me someone I like." So he was more like team leader. Yeah. Yeah. But like he was the nominated guy, like. You can take the flack. Ah, oh, right. So, yeah, he moved into Downing Street, um, which he liked. A lot of politicians didn't like it because it was quite cramped. Mm. Like, why would we move out of our big, nice mansion when we could, you know... It's a, it's a mid-terrace, isn't it? Yeah. In London. <laughs> <laughs> of course, this, this wasn't a great time to become Chancellor Exchequer because you had a huge social unrest. Mm. Poor harvests were continuing. Mm-hmm. Uh, workers were rioting over fear of jobs being lost to mechanisation. Mm-hmm. And then there was a weird story which we won't go too much into but it's something people can look into around uh, a fellow called John Wilkes almost Robin Hood-esque type politician a lot of people liked him and he was popular he wrote an article once that was considered blasphemous and slanderous towards the king and so he had to leave the country for a bit because he was tried in absentia but he, he caused North a lot of problems so North actually helped in getting him tried in absentia and then he came back for a bit and ran as an MP and won mm. and then the, he had a whole trial in parliament and got off and it was just it was a bit of a pain Right. For a while. Yeah, he became Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1767 and then the leader of the Commons the year later. Mm. So he had a, a good political career. But uh, he wouldn't become Prime Minister for another couple of years. And that was in 1770. So in 1770, North uh, actually succeeds Grafton as Prime Minister, forming his government on the 28th of January. Uh, North enjoyed a relatively good relationship with the king, unlike some of his predecessors. North had a very deep respect for the monarchy, which obviously pleased George, what if he was the monarchy after all. Uh, And he also believed in the power of royal prerogative over Parliament, which some of his contemporaries were not quite so keen on. North actually made such a good impression with the king that in 1772, he he became the first commoner since Robert Walpole to receive the Order of the Garter. Five years later, the king also paid off all of North's personal debts and he actually ended up paying off somewhere in the region of £16,000, which would have been about £1.8 in today's money. It's actually quite sweet, the, the letter he wrote him. He basically said, look, I don't... It, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically mm. said, look, I know you've got lots of financial trouble, my mm. dear friend, but just tell me the figure, mate, and I'll sort it out for you. No questions. That is a nice thing to do. I mean, was there an ulterior motive or was he just being friendly? North always 
felt this was another reason why he had to stick around to be the PM when he wanted to resign mm. later on. But it, he didn't use it against... He emotionally blackmailed him many times, the king, but yeah. mainly to stay in office. But he never brought up the money. I suppose if you've had a string of prime ministers from the perspective of the king that you either didn't get on with or you didn't approve of them, and suddenly you get a guy who you feel, oh, this, this guy's all right. You're probably going to try to make a bit of an effort with him to keep him on board. Anyway, so Great Britain in 1770, when North became prime minister, obviously it was having its issues in uh, North America, but it was generally doing quite well. Uh, it recently succeeded in the Seven Years' War of uh, 1756 to 1763. Uh, where it was able to win one over its uh, favourite adversaries at the time, France and Spain. Uh, yeah, so the good relationship with the king's side, when mm. North entered Parliament, he faced overwhelming opposition. Mm. Uh, in fact, it's <laughs> in his first five sessions, he rose to speak over 800 times. Right. No wonder he had sort of <laughs> health issues towards the end of his life. He must have had bad um, knees. Very bad knees. Uh, in fact, he would often fall asleep in the Commons. And he'd either just shut his eyes or put a hanky over his face. But he was still quite sharp because every time he was like asleep and someone made an insult, he would then retort some sort of witty comeback by taking off the hanky and then putting it back on. Uh, funnily enough, he, he survived the onslaught. But one of the crucial things he didn't do mm. was uh, a biggie. So do you remember the um, the duty tax that Townsend introduced? Yes. So there was a bill introduced to repeal uh, all the duties. Mm. But... North didn't want to do this for tea. Ah. Specifically tea. He saw tea as a luxury and he said, well, it's a luxury. They can pay duty on that, mate. Mm. And the bill didn't pass. And everyone said this is going to piss... Well, a few people said this is going to piss off the Americans if this doesn't pass. And it didn't pass. Mm. And what happened? It pissed off the Americans. Mm -hmm. We'll touch briefly on the East India Company because this is an important point that mm. feeds into the whole American conflict. So in, in 1773, the East India Company was going bankrupt. It was losing authority. It was governing terribly in India. Hmm. And uh, the government sort of stepped in and, and said, look, you need to take over this. And North was a bit opposed to this because he didn't want to inject government control into a private enterprise. So very conservative thinking. Mm -hmm. And they sort of reached a deal in the end where they would sort of give them a big loan to cover some costs. And a lot of the appointments that the East India Company would make to govern in these territories, they mm -hmm. would have to have crown and government approval to get through. So the private company could nominate them and the government would go, yeah, right, we think that's a good appointment. Right. So they, he kind of put a sticking plaster on it. But one of the things he did was introduce a bill allowing the East India Company to sell products to America mm. without any duties on them. Ah. So this was called the Tea Act and it mm. abolished export on tea and gave the East India, East India Company the sole tea trade monopoly for America. However, what he didn't do was cancel the previous levy on tea that was already existing. Right. Which would have been quite a clever move because already America was already smuggling in lots of Dutch tea mm. because they didn't want to pay the levies on yeah. the tea existing because they're like, why are we paying for tea? And if he had removed that duty, the mm. East Indian Company would have been able to sell their tea and completely get rid of the smuggled tea because there wouldn't be any advantage in buying the smuggled tea when you had an official source that you didn't have to pay a duty on. Yeah. The whole reason they didn't want the tea was because they had to pay the duty on it. The duty must have been quite steep for it, there to be a viable market for smuggling it in from it, the it, Netherlands. It wasn't that steep. It was more the principle. Oh, it was the principle. It was like they just didn't want to pay it. Oh, they were stubborn. Yeah. Okay. There was the argument that it was <coughs> detrimental to local merchants, but it mm. wasn't. It, it wouldn't bankrupt them. And, uh, of course, this led to a bunch of East India ships dropping off tea mm. to America. Funny enough, one of the ships was called the Dartmouth. Right. Um, and the uh, the American secretary at the time was Lord Dartmouth. Basically, North's decision led to quite possibly the worst tea party of all time. Cold, salty water, no sugar, no milk. It's like, I mean, that that there, that's the real crime. What followed was North's attempt at being harsh and cracking down mm. by closing Boston Port with a blockade um, and amending the Massachusetts Constitution to sort of humiliate them, in a way. Yeah. Um, so several several missteps already. Quite, quite a few missteps. Mm. But he also introduced a bill where uh, criminals could then be transferred from America to other colonies. 
to face trial because he didn't have faith in the American judiciary system, which didn't try, give people a trial. They didn't have a jury. Right. And he didn't like that. And that, the Americans took that as an insult. So, that, I mean, that goes against the idea that, you know, that goes back to Magna Carta of being tried by your peers, though, doesn't it? Yeah. But it was a great insult to the Americans. They thought, well, mm. deal with our own criminals, mate. We don't need you to take them away from us. Yeah. All our times change. <laughs> There was this view in Parliament that America were just misbehaving children and yeah. that they needed to be brought into line. And there was never never thought in a million years that America could resist British might. And that was a massive miscalculation. And there was such a different range of opinions and views in states. They never thought for a second 13 states would come together and agree a plan to resist Britain, which mm. they did in 1774 with the Continental Congress, which we all know. Yeah. Uh, although initially it was 12 states because Georgia was like, I'm not sure about this. And well, then they joined a year later. Yeah, I mean, Georgia was named after... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a bit embarrassing, really. So, actually, he, uh, North actually called a new parliament uh, in 1774. He called an election early because, mm. basically, the America wasn't going particularly well and he wanted a mandate for his policies that he'd enacted so far, and he won quite convincingly. And this would be the parliament that would last for the majority of, of the American war. The Continental Congress, when it formed... Uh, they asked for the repeal of all legislation uh, affecting them since 1763. Right. <laughs> so it's a, not much. Right. Um, uh, but not independence. They said, we're happy to be part of the empire. We just want, you know, you to stop taxing us and governing us. And hmm. and they did this by placing a trade embargo with Britain. They said, we're not giving you any more goods. And then they began training troops in preparation for oh. conflict and stockpiling weapons. Now, the British didn't particularly like this. So the governor in charge at the time, of uh, Massachusetts, who also happened to be the commander-in-chief of the entire army, mm -hmm. General Gage, was yeah. ordered to put a stop to this, round up ringleaders, arrest dissidents, and burn weapons. And this led to what was be described as the first shot of the American War of Independence at Concord, uh, after, basically, the Americans heard the British were coming to get some weapons and mm -hmm. destroy them, so they took as much as they could, hid them, uh, and then stood outside in formation outside the town. Um, and there was, it wasn't a massive amount of troops he sent General Gage, but they eventually got into a standoff. Neither side had orders to fire unless mm. they were fired upon. And no one knows who fired the first shot. We'll never know who kick-started the War of Independence, whether it was the untrained Americans holding firearms mm. or the trained Grenadier Guards holding firearms. Yeah. But someone fired a shot. Uh, the Americans quickly dispersed, mm. but a few people died one British casualty, but like about seven or eight Americans died. So this this was the first armed conflict of the Revolutionary War then, was it? It's the, it is classed as the first armed conflict. It was not meant to be an armed conflict, yeah. but it turned into one. And all the while, North was introducing bills in Parliament to try and sort of balance this sort of carrot and stick method. On the one hand, it would introduce punitive measures like mm. crackdowns on trade embargoes, etc., in response to their trade embargo. On the other hand, say, look, you can have all... We'll repeal some of this. We'll change some of that. But this... I mean, this goes back to what we were saying about North's desire to avoid conflict. He wanted to get everyone on board and find the compromise, and he ended up just pissing everyone off. And, and to be honest, public opinion was with him. They didn't want the Americans to have their way. Mm. Parliament didn't want them to have their way. The king certainly didn't want them to have their way. Um, but he always wanted peace. Like, he wasn't a fan of fighting in war. Mm. But it was probably his indecision to commit to one or the other that made this a mess, and it was poor timing... So, for instance, Lord Dartmouth would eventually resign as American Secretary during the war and get replaced by someone called George Germain. But he was probably too warlike and probably would have ended up with a lot more blood on his hands if he had taken full control. Yeah. But as American Secretary, he was sort of in charge of a lot of the war effort. Right. So North was actually quite ill for a lot of the American War of Independence. And Germain was coordinating with the two generals that replaced General Gage. General Gage was basically recalled by the king because he thought he was doing a shit job. Right. And then he sent out two generals uh, to replace him who basically didn't coordinate well with each other mm. and Germain's instructions, because there was also a delay. So they were fighting a war, a transatlantic war, in a time when communication was by letter and by boat. Yeah. I've, I think the sort of reputation for this war is, is that part of the reason why the Americans were successful was that the British were disorganised. They didn't really have to rap together. And I think going into this, I, I sort of went in assuming that that, that would be a misconception. But they kind of didn't have their act together. It sounds like it was a little bit mismanaged, really. So in January 1775, to, this was before the Concord happened, the cabinet had agreed a policy where they offered the chance for the colonies to pay for their own government, their own justice, hmm. and their own defence. 
and this would not be taxed by Britain. The only thing that could be taxed by Britain was commercial taxes. Right. So they were still clinging to that idea. And this would have actually probably gone down well if they'd introduced it earlier. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, before that bill was even in- introduced to offer to the Americans, mm. North had passed a, a New England bill a few days before embargoing trade. So by now, the war was in full swing. However, despite a few victories, uh, Britain found itself unable to secure a decisive victory against the colonists. So they ended up with a bit of a stalemate. Uh, this situation was made worse when uh, Britain's favourite antagonists, France and Spain, reappeared and decided to join on the side of the colonies, um, joined by the Dutch Republic. Uh, This situation resulted in Britain now having to fight a war on four continents and with absolutely no allies at all on their side. Uh, And suddenly the country's brief high following its success in the Seven Years' War seemed like a pretty distant memory. Um, Seeing an opportunity while the British Navy was distracted and ever the fan of a good armada, Spain was planning a joint naval invasion of Britain in 1779. Uh, The idea was to first take the Isle of Wight, followed by Portsmouth and ultimately the mainland. Uh, Ultimately, sadly, the plan was abandoned. Um, Which is sadly. (laughs) Sadly, it was abandoned. (laughs) Could have done without the Isle of Wight. Uh, Presumably due to the threat of swift retribution from the fearsome Isle of Wight residents. Of course, yes. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't want to mess with a population of uh, retirees armed with buckets and spades. Um, however, one invasion that did take place, funny mm. enough, uh, was the invasion of Canada. Ah. So American troops actually marched into Canada and took Montreal for a bit and oh. then tried to take Quebec. So had, had Britain taken Montreal and Quebec at this point then? Yeah, they were governing Canada. So that actually they were governing a large par- portion of Canada which was actually primarily French. Right. And one of, one of actually North's successes was introducing the Quebec Bill, which guaranteed the rights of French Catholics to actually live. Yeah. <laughs> so there was actually a lot of positive British sentiment among the French and the English populations there. Oh, and when okay. the Americans came along and tried to rile them up and say, we, we are freeing you and then invading their cities, they were like, no, go away. We're happy with the British. Yeah. And then from from there, it kind of there's a couple of victories, but they come at massive costs. So you have a succession of v- um, victories in ha- in finger quotes here, right? Like the Battle of Bunker Hill near Boston. But it was it was these costly victories that just cost them. There was no sort of joined up thinking with the generals. Mm. Dartmouth had gone in 1775 to be replaced by Germain, who we mentioned. He was again quite warlike. Um, and he came up with plans in conjunction with, with William Howe and another general, Burgoyne. Mm. Um, and both never really had joined up thinking. North wasn't really involved. Like he was, during this time, he, he had really poor health. And most of the running of the America was left to the secretary and also George III, who didn't really know what he was doing. Right. Um, which is another, another reason why North is probably unfairly blamed for the war, but he didn't keep a lid on things. Yeah. But he wasn't really that much involved in the day-to-day running. He was more involved in the parliamentary recourse, like trying to pursue peace through legislation and mm. not really succeeding. So anyway, Germain, Burgoyne and Howe come up with this plan to sort of invade America using New York as a base. Burgoyne has to march his troops to, to capture the whole state of New York. Um, unfortunately, Howe decides to change plans midway through and sell to Philadelphia. Burgoyne basically marches into New York, has a supply issue, finds himself surrounded by American forces. There was supposed to be a third diversionary force coming from Canada, but they had to stop and turn around. Mm. Uh, He doesn't have his backup from Howe. Um, And it leads to the first spectacular defeat in Saratoga. But as uh, North, as we said, was kind of absent. Like he's dealing with his family issues. His son was sick. He had a son, Dudley, hmm. who nearly died and would, in fact, go on to die at the age of two. Upon hearing the news of Saratoga, he immediately offered to resign. Right. Didn't. Okay. <laughs> because the king said, I don't accept it. Oh, the king told him not to. Yeah, so every time he offered to resign, it was a recurring thing. He, he did it in, the, the, obviously, the 18th century polite way. My king, I am so devoted to you. I love you. I resign. Yeah. Uh, and the king would go, no, you're not. <laughs> Hang on a minute. I, I, because he would say, if you're truly devoted to me, you wouldn't do this. Well, he, he's got a prime minister. He can boss around a bit. So he, he probably thinks, well, I don't want to risk it with any of the others. I'm going to keep you. So North then tried to work on legislation where he proposed peace, but also included more coercive legislation. So he tried to suspend this, uh, Parliament's claim to tax America and presented this to the House mm. uh, in 1778. It was met with dull silence, but still managed to pass because he was just amazing at 
getting laws to pass. He had this personality, even if people didn't agree with him, they were like, it makes sense. And the other part of this bill was the establishment of a commission to treat with the American Congress, mm. for which he sent three people. Um, one of the MPs who'd managed to suggest the commission in the first place, that his name was Eden. Then there was Johnston, a former Florida governor who was v- really opposed to independence. Right. Good <laughs> choice. Is, yeah. And then uh, a 29-year-old kid called the Earl of Carlisle, who made the leader of the commission. But the thing is, North didn't choose the commission. He sort of said, this is a good idea, and left other people to make it. I think this is the thing. In, in North's defence, is there was a lot more going on than just the Revolutionary War at the time. There was He had problems on several different fronts going on. And even if he were slightly more attentive, I think it still would have been a challenge to balance all of that. Mm. Um, this commission set sail to America, but by then it was already too late. By the time they arrived, Howard gone. He'd been replaced by someone called Clinton. This combined with the fact that the French had now entered the war, basically the Americans said, we're now no longer accepting anything but independence. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. So while Britain did manage to win the old battle, it was eventually its defeat at the Siege of Yorktown, which dealt a huge blow to its uh, prospects in the war. Uh, North took it particularly badly. Uh, Upon hearing the news, he was said to have exclaimed, Oh God, it's all over. And for North, it pretty much was at that point. North was desperately trying to tell the king in a series of letters and meetings, like, you've got to, you've got to let this go, mate. He, it wasn't going well. Mm-hmm. North himself had been dealing with a whole bunch of issues around Ireland, India, as well as America, as well as the ill health. It was all starting to fall apart. And all the opposition who had been trying to support the government, although not very well, because <laughs> they were still very vocal and opposite, <laughs> We're finally smelling blood around, you know, around this time. Mm. Um, it was it, it staggered on until 1782. Of course, Yorktown was 1781. Mm. North was begging the king, please accept my resignation. Please accept my <laughs> resignation. Uh, motions were introduced of confidence over the government policies, which then developed into confidence in the government itself. And they were they they were won, but by the skin of their teeth. In fact, the, the confidence in the government was won by I think a, a vote of one. Right. And then someone tabled another motion because they could just keep tabling motion to do this. And that was scheduled for the 20th of March on 1782. And he's writing and writing. On the 18th, he sends him a letter saying, look, please don't make me go through this humiliation. <laughs> and then on the 20th, he, he goes to see the king and mm. they have like a two-hour conversation. And at the end of it, finally, <laughs> finally, the king <laughs> says, you can resign, but I won't forget this. <laughs> right. Um, although, to be fair, they did actually leap part on good terms. He gave him a nice pension. And everyone knew that he was going to basically resign, but they all wanted to, to make the vote of confidence happen. Oh, they wanted to be the one who <laughs> yeah, yeah. who dealt the final blow. Uh, but anyway, protocol gives way to that. And so yeah. when someone tried to then finally, after a couple of hours of arguing, table the motion, mm. North, as his right, could interject. Yeah. Um, and in his interjection, he basically says, government's gone, mate. No need for the motion. Bye. And then he went home for a nice dinner with some friends. And everyone said he was in a really good mood. Yeah. After having just had to dissolve his government and step down. I mean, I mean as you say, he, he had been trying for a long time to resign. This is a man who had had enough of his job. He's remembered as a really competent chancellor. Before the American War, he'd reduced the national debt by about 7%, mm. which is incredible. Yeah. And for, I think, uh, over eight years and six of those years, he was chancellor. Yeah. So he'd, he'd done an incredible financial job. And it was just the American war that came along and ruined his reputation because he didn't know how to handle... He was trying to balance so much and he didn't do it very well. But North, he, um, I mean, that wasn't really the end of him. He, he did return to government in 1783 as Home Secretary under the Fox North Coalition. Uh, his old friend, King George III, who was still around, uh, he didn't really care much for um, the coalition as they had uh, sort of some slightly Republican... Uh, sentiments which obviously he didn't really agree with and he he considered North's involvement in this to be uh, a bit of a betrayal and he never really forgave him for it although that wasn't the main reason no there was something else to yeah so back in 1780 during one of the elections he raised a lot of funds Mm. under the king's name basically after the king said you need to do this and he never paid the debt and so when the king went to the bank in question called Drummond's to get more money for something else. They said, you're not having any until you pay this debt. And so the king paid 13 grand of it. 
and then asked North to pay the rest, in which North was like, I don't really know if I should pay this. I, I was under, you know. Anyway, he sort of kind of half agreed to do it and then didn't do anything. And so the king ended up having to pay the rest of the debt and then thought, you've, you've defrauded me out of money here. And so this great friendship sort of ended with the king and North parting, un- you know, in acrimonious circumstances over money. Which is quite sad. Uh, North continued to sit in Parliament as a backbencher, however, uh, despite going blind in 1786. And then in 1790, his father died and he became the second Earl of Guildford and moved over to the House of Lords. Uh, North then died not long after, on the 5th of August, 1792. And he was buried in All Saints Church in Roxton in Oxfordshire. Mm, Near the family home. That's it. Though um, his old home um, is now ironically, owned by an American university. <laughs> of course. Yeah. It's one of those beautiful twists of fate. Um, and yes, it, it, he had poor health all his life. Mm. And as you he said, he went blind towards the end. But it did nothing to dampen his spirit. Like yeah. he, he remained as jovial as ever when he passed. And he spent all these years saying, I'm not good enough for these jobs before accepting them. Mm. Maybe believing a little that he wasn't as... Maybe he, he kind of basically had imposter syndrome for everything he did, but he still pursued it anyway. Yeah. So you'd say to his credit, he had a hard job to do. He wasn't necessarily entirely willing, but he gave it a decent shot. You feel like, you know, he did make an effort. Maybe it didn't work out so well. No, and I think he was a capable minister and he did a good job, but... He didn't have many capable opponents that could come in and face him, mostly because he also had this good friendship with the king. But mm. he was an average man. Yeah. He was an average statesman. But the, it's it's not it's not as engaging story, though, is it? No. The um, the fight <laughs> against the uh, imperialist rulers who are a bit meh. Um, and probably why George III gets painted as the villain, because he was so steadfast in his belief, and North yeah. was kind of a bit half in, half out, as he was in most things in his life. Yeah. Um, but, to, you know, North's credit, um, it's not like he could have stood up to the king and said, no, I'm not, we're not doing that, because he was the king. It's good to be king. It is good to be king, until you make some really crappy decisions, and then you become the villain. Thank God, thank God royalty still doesn't have as much say. <laughs> yeah. Did you find anything brief and interesting? I did actually, yes. I found this is a topic very, very close to my heart here actually. Um, so, um, when um, Lord North was Prime Minister, his first Lord of the Admiralty was a man called John Montague. Uh, he was otherwise known as the Earl of Sandwich, which is a, an old English title. And now, the Earl of Sandwich is also the supposed namesake of the popular handheld snack. A sandwich. The sandwich, yes. Yeah. He was um, Mr. Sandwich himself, was a Lord, first Lord of the Admiralty under um, Lord North. But yeah, that was my interesting fact. Yeah. Um, is there anything that... The, uh, that you noticed that was particularly interesting, or any, any sort of misunderstandings, or well, I th- something that we we didn't touch upon was uh, in 1780 under his tenure, North tenure, mm. and I'll try and be brief about this. There was a series of riots that gripped London and caused thousands and thousands of pounds of damage and lots and lots of deaths as soldiers opened fire in the streets. Mm. Um, it's effectively several days of rioting, and it was all motivated because of bigots who didn't like Catholics. Right. So, so they'd introduced a bill the Catholic Relief Act of 1778 to make it easier for Catholics to practice their religion. And this didn't go down well, especially in Scotland, who really don't like Catholics. Uh, Lord George Gordon marched to Parliament with supposedly 60,000 people, but no way of knowing if that's true, Mm -hmm. and presented a petition uh, to basically overturn this. And it was rejected by 192 votes to seven. This led to widespread rioting with uh, almost 20,000 people going crazy but authorities were incredibly slow to react. In fact, the law officers argued over whether it was permissible to send out the troops until a magistrate had read the riot act. It's crazy. Um, North, meanwhile, was having dinner in Downing Street, <laughs> surrounded by only seven guards. And he basically said to the guards, like, if they'd come at you, just fire. Screw the riot act. <laughs> um, to which they told the crowd. <laughs> the well, crowd promptly dispersed. We, we will shoot you. Yeah, regardless. basically. Yeah, yeah. Lord 
Gordon was arrested and charged with treason, but was found not guilty in the end. Mm. Uh, but a bunch of other people got hung. And the Lord Mayor was given a thousand pound fine for failure to get the right ac- <laughs> the right thread. <laughs> Lord Gordon, that's a classic example of being on the wrong side of history there. Yeah. Cool. Well, that that's our uh, that's our episode. Um, I hope you have found it enlightening. So you go for the hard sell. Yeah, you well, do a North. Interesting. Maybe you've learned something you didn't know. You know, maybe you've learned that Lord North existed in the first place. Please do subscribe. We're on all the usual podcast services. We're on Spotify, Apple, Google. Uh, you can email us at info at the show, And we're also on social. So if you'd like to follow us on that or send us a message, if you've got any questions or compliments, we especially like compliments. All is left is for us to say goodbye and to leave you with the clue for the next episode. When you fancy a fruity treat, unzip a banana. Fruit and vegetables start selling at five. It's the early birds who get in first to catch the bargains. Serious business starts a little later. Foods with lots of vitamin C in them include orange juice, grapefruit, strawberries, melons, and of course, whole oranges. Thank you.